Fantastic. Welcome, everybody. This is our September. My gosh, I nearly said October. Um, September <laughs> Women IT Pros Call for APAC. Uh, Jess and I have been noticing a lot of people getting particularly tired towards the end of the year. So our topic this month of burnout and mental health in the workforce um, is pretty timely at the moment for a lot of people, I think. Um, I'm going to start off with a bit of a disclaimer. Um, we are not professional mental health uh, advice people so this call is definitely just a chance for us to share our experiences and what has worked or not worked for us um, please if you are feeling any sort of signs and symptoms um, go and seek some professional help I know it's much easier to say that than it is to do it um, but hopefully this may be the encouragement that you need to maybe change some habits or uh, go and talk to somebody. So yes, we are not the professionals. This is all just based on our experience. Um, I'm Sonia Gough, a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft, and with me is the amazing Jess Dodson. Say hi, Jess. Hi, Jess. Um, <laughs> so yes, Jess Dodson, senior customer engineer with Microsoft. I have just chucked into the chat as well some phone numbers for Australia and New Zealand around some of the help services that you can get if you are experiencing any distress at the moment or you're thinking you do need to have a chat to someone by all means reach out to us we love chatting to people but if you think you do need to have a chat to someone and and delve into it a little bit deeper there's some numbers there that you could give a call if if you need to reach out yeah absolutely so this conversation this month is completely unscripted we have no slides we have no talking points we're just going to sit here and have a bit of a chat and see where it leads us please jump into the meeting chat if you'd like to share your experience or ask a question also you are more than welcome to come off mute and turn your camera on if you feel comfortable doing so um, but we will address questions in the chat as well so we're not doing a QA and a at the end um, feel free to jump in whenever so Jess, end of September, we have three months left in the year. Can you believe that? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it's terrifying. So my calendar looks absolutely disgusting. I have a single week free. Um, I hope I probably shouldn't advertise that to my customers. Um, I have one week free um, in December at the moment and that's it. That's literally all I've got left. So I'm jam packed. And I think a lot of people are feeling the same. They've got so much they want to try and get done before the end of the year. We've got this uncertainty of COVID, I hate saying it, but we've got the uncertainty of that looming over us, the possibility of going into snap lockdowns. We've got people who are currently in lockdowns in ACT and New South Wales and Victoria. It's, I think a lot of people are feeling a little bit on edge um, because it is very uncertain at the moment and we don't deal very well with uncertainty. We're not good at that. <laughs> yeah, I think you're hitting the nail on the head there. And it's, it's funny because on one hand, the uncertainty is hard, but on the other hand, I was saying to my manager that I find sometimes from a mental health perspective that I can get bored if I'm doing the same kind of work for too long and I need a bit of variety. And I think that's a little bit different. Like when you're when it's uncertainty over circumstances in terms of the things that you're going to be able to do we had a lot of uncertainty leading up to the end uh leading up to the start of the school holidays here where every day we needed to check and make sure whether or not uh, our planned family holiday was going to go ahead now we planned a holiday within our state to help reduce any risk of border closures um, however we still managed to get caught up in a positive COVID case that went through Brisbane airport that meant that while we were on holiday we had to go and get COVID tests and quarantine until we got our negative results through and we were literally about 30 minutes and one other shop away from being a close contact of a positive case that would have seen us having to do a mandatory 14 day quarantine of, of isolation. So that's how uncertain, you know, and how quickly life can change at the moment on a dime in terms of having a lot of restrictions on you that just completely change your plans. Um, and, you know, that is the current state of our world right now, whether or not that's gonna change in the future with vaccination rates going up, who knows? But I get the feeling that a lot of people, as much as we're starting to talk about what the future could look like, what's Christmas going to be like, when are we going to 
going to be able to travel overseas again. We're still very much in survival mode of just literally living 24 hours at a time to see what the impact is going to be on the next weekend that's coming up, for example. And and I think for a lot of people, I got asked a question recently is why does everything feel so heavy? And I don't <laughs> think it's that everything is heavy. I think it's, it is literally that straw that broke the camel's back. It's not that everything is heavy. It's that there's just so much that we're carrying right now. And we've been carrying for such a long time that we forget we've been doing this for nearly two years. We're coming up to nearly two years of COVID restrictions and lockdowns and border closures. And it's, it's very wearing on people's mental health and it, it particularly for those who are somewhat extroverted and may want to be around other people being locked in and being sort of segregated away from others is really really tough so trying to find ways to still keep in contact with people and ensuring that you do have and I say it all the time having a tribe of people that you can talk to that you can be around and vent and who are going to listen and they're not going to judge you is so important and I think a lot of people might be missing that at the moment because their workplace used to be that and they don't have that at the moment. Yeah, and you know, we didn't intend to turn this into the the COVID edition talk, but it ex is extremely relevant right now and it's interesting to see how some things have changed but some things very much have stayed the same. So, I did a talk about burnout um, a couple of years ago now and you know, having that tribe of people that uh, you know well enough to have these open and honest conversations with and more importantly, the people who know you well enough to see the changes in your behaviour or to notice when you're not as chatty amongst that group as you used to be and, and they check in on you, um, that always was important. And we've just kind of seen things like that magnify and, and increase in terms of how important they are right now. I've done this remote role for Microsoft for the last three years. And so it's interesting because when I tell people that I work from Microsoft, but I do a, a, a roll remotely from home they're like oh you know is that because of COVID I'm like no this role for me has always been remote but it's totally different in the COVID era because I used to see my team at least three or four times a year in person at various places around the world of course none of that's happening I haven't seen my manager in you know two years now and it's it's tough I'm I'm the person who likes to be on stage when I'm talking and explaining technical concepts and I'm connecting with people and I, I love that. I, I really do miss it. But I am also the person who escapes back to my hotel room and recharges or like gets off stage and then like hides in the bathroom for half an hour because I just need to like conferences are, are busy and noisy and full of people and so many conversations and I love it in the moment and then I just go and go, oh my gosh, my battery. I need to go and hide. <laughs> and yeah. need to hide and, and recharge. <laughs> But I even miss that. And so there is kind of this myth that, oh, COVID's easy for the introverts because they just get to stay home and like, isn't that the life they always wanted to? And I'm like, damn it, no, I'm actually missing the contact that I used to have with people. And it's funny, I was actually having a chat to somebody about that in that the way a lot of people used to interact has changed very much. And I have found that my extroversion has been dimmed by being at home and I actually do get social anxiety with going and thinking that I'm going to have to be around large groups of people and um, an example of this was a work function that was last week um, I was going to attend I was ready to attend and then the day came and I couldn't leave the house no. <laughs> literally couldn't leave the house and I think it comes down to where it has, and I hate the phrase, the new normal, and this has become that new normal, that we are very much in our own little silos. And I don't know how long it's going to be that way. And I think no one knows how long it's going to be that way. And trying to find new ways to deal with that and new ways to deal with how our mental health is going and trying to come out of our bubbles and sharing again with other people. I think that's that's going to be really tough. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't disagree. And all of the things that we put in place in the early days, you know, the water cooler meetings and the social channels and teams and all the rest of it, 
people are just tired of that. Like we're all we're all done. Um, dare I say it, talking to a video camera, but we're all, we're all done with social connections. And as you said, being in the industry for us is quite strange because we got busier than ever. And I know that there are a lot of people who, um, you know, their businesses have suffered and they've they've lost hours of work and um, and they're in a rough shape. But in the IT industry and, and, you know, in particular, the roles that we do, we've gotten even busier. We've got more opportunities to go and do work because people are happy for it to be done remotely. Um, and so we're now kind of balancing that you know, as as well. You said that you've got a really full calendar for the rest of the year. So how are you managing the balance, the demands of working? Balance? What your balance? Mental health? Um, <laughs> I think I, I actually, and I think it's different for everyone, I like to keep working. If I'm bored, I find that that's when the fears play in your head. So I actually like to keep busy. At the same time, I've got some, what I consider to be, downtime so I've got a couple of those wellness days booked in and I've locked them in so when I say I'm busy for the rest of the year that's because those days are already locked in and I'm refusing to budge them um so I have a couple of days I have a long weekend coming up this weekend it is a four-day weekend for me which is going to be lovely um but I think trying to find ways that we can still keep those connections even though I know that we're over all of that, trying to just find little ways to keep some of those connections. I know a, a bunch of us play video games on a Friday night. That's lovely. It's fun. It's relaxing. People can have a, a drink or two if they want. And then there's also the fact that it's not work related whatsoever. We're not talking about work. It's not using work systems. It's completely unrelated. So people can kind of let their hair down a little bit. I try and keep my work out of my weekends if I can. I think um, utilising things like I have Android work profile, so I turn my work profile off on my phone. So I can't see emails, I can't see Teams, I literally can't even open the application at all. It's amazing. It, it prevents me from the temptation to even do that. So I think those kind of things from a mental health perspective are really important to to shut off sometimes because working from home means that those lines, the lines don't exist. It's not just blurred. They don't exist. <laughs> so I get up of a morning. The first thing I will do is check my phone and see what I have to do for the day, which is ridiculous. I shouldn't be doing that. I should be able to sit in bed and read Facebook and look at memes and laugh. No, no, that's not what I do anymore. So blurring those lines has become really, really tricky for those of us who look for balance and making sure that you are still getting that me time and I don't just mean mean time in spend some time going and having a shower or walk outside for 10 minutes no actual proper me time of not looking at work not focusing on anything work related doing something you enjoy for a good couple of hours that's proper me time so that you can actually get out of your own head yeah, I, I love it. That's super important. And I love that you mentioned that this is different for everybody, right? Um, because I, I've, I've learned over the years to take a longer term version of, of, of a longer term view of balance for me. So balance might not necessarily be working from nine to five, like my my work habits and, and my work schedule doesn't fit like that. And I could possibly wrangle it so that it did if that's what I wanted. But I work with an international team and sometimes things come up where I make the decision that it is worth me doing something live outside of normal Australian business hours or there's something that I'm interested in or there's something that I'm still working on. And yeah, like it's nearly 6 p.m. and I haven't started dinner yet, but I'm into it. So I'm not about to down tools at 5 p.m. Um, just because that's an arbitrary number. But I am very conscious of the longer term of that and going, you know what? This week I've had a, a couple of calls after hours and I might even need to do a Saturday morning, but then next week I'll button off a little bit and I might have finished early on a Friday or, you know, take a longer lunch break or whatever. So being able to have the flexibility to control my time like that is a blessing and a curse. I'm, I'm grateful that I'm in a role that enables me to do that. I know that it's not as easy when you're in an IT operations role where you're serving business as in the, the people inside your organisation that are working 
working on more standard day, when you're answering help desk calls or you're um, monitoring or rolling out production systems, like you don't have that level of flexibility. And we haven't even talked about being on call after hours yet. Um, but I do appreciate now that I'm in a role where I can go away on holiday for a week with my family. I can uninstall my work apps off my phone and say, I'm not, you can't contact me. You know, the after of the office message says contact my, my manager while I'm away um, and I've got the luxury and it is a luxury to be able to do that I, I, I fully admit that but I do sort of take that longer term approach to how my balance works out because sometimes work does need to take priority sometimes time takes a priority I had a, um, a good friend that said to me a long time ago that uh, work is like a Labrador dog it will eat everything that you feed it and there is certainly a line when you have this uh, flexibility to also understand your responsibility to yourself to control um, how much food you're giving that Labrador dog because I could work a significant amount more hours in my week than I do on things that I enjoy and work would, you know, would be happy for the output. But unless you've got a manager that's really going to come down hard on you about the number of hours that you're doing, and we don't tend to work like that, that flexibility also means that I'm responsible for a little bit of self-management about the amount of work that I've got on my plate as well. So that is something I'm very conscious of. And I like the way that you said, like, you've got that flexibility and you have the ability to turn things off and point things to your manager. And having a supportive manager is really important. And I know a number of people who they have come and joined Microsoft and they now have a supportive manager. And for them, it is the first supportive manager they have ever had. And it is a real mental shift to get into the behavior of no my manager has my back and if your manager doesn't have your back I feel incredibly sorry for you and please reach out we will try and help find you a manager that will because I think that when it comes to your work life having a manager who will help you and will look after you and I call them shit shields um, as much as they probably hate that term to actually be able to protect you so that your not burning yourself out so that you're looking after yourself and they help you look after yourself because sometimes you can be your own worst enemy. Um, so finding someone who can do that as a manager is really, really important and, and getting someone who will stand up for you when you don't have the ability to do it, I think is is vital and it is a luxury as well. So mm -hmm. I'm very lucky. My current manager and my new manager who will be starting next week, um, mm -hmm. are, they are both amazing people and they are good managers who want to look after their people. And I don't know if we've got any other people managers on the call. Um, I've managed staff before. I've managed a team of over 20 people in four different locations. And I think one of the key takeaways for managers is the, the point that you mentioned at the start that I reiterated that everybody's different. So you can't manage people the same. You can't have the same expectations from, um, from one person to another in terms of what they think is suitable or how they, you know, how they run their day. So that's very, uh, very interesting to learn that you can't manage your expectation of what work-life balance looks like doesn't necessarily mean that that's how your team are going to react. And you're going to find differences within your team as well. So it's very sort of interesting to uh, to take into account as well. Now, we've, we've spoken a lot so far about volume of work and the amount of hours that you've done. But another interesting aspect to burnout and managing your mental health and your general happiness with work are some other factors as well. And they include things like whether or not you are strongly driven by feeling that the work you're doing is important and it's making a difference, whether or not you're being listened to and whether or not the ideas that you bring forward are being respected and thought through and action. And it doesn't necessarily mean that everything that you raise is going to create an amazing amount of change in your workforce um, and, you know, all your ideas are going to be implemented, but just literally feeling like you're not talking to a brick wall all the time. <laughs> and so there are a number of sort of those other aspects um, that are an element of your job that can just as easily lead to, to burnout. It also includes things like feeling that 
your workplace is saying something, especially if they're doing training about their ethics and their values and stuff. But then on the other hand, they're making decisions that don't seem to reflect that, like they're cutting down allowances that you get, for example, or, you know, they're they're going on about how they reward performance and then it doesn't feel like you've been rewarded for the performance that you thought you had. So there's all of these different aspects um, that make up you generally being happy and healthy with work that can just literally start to wear you down. And there's uh, some interesting research that's been done. So my two favourite people in this space on burnout and mental health are Christina Maslach and Susan Jackson. And they were actually sort of the first people to put together a psychological assessment to um, look at what they call the burnout inventory, which is the different aspects of the symptoms of burnout. And they include things like emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, personal accomplishment, cynicism, and professional efficacy. And so they encompass all of these things. And the interesting thing is that all of those things I just said, none of them were too much work, right? <laughs> so, I don't like the cynicism one. I'm like, if cynicism is honestly <laughs> going to be one of those markers, I am screwed. I am in burnout 350% of the time. Oh, I so wanted to see your face when I said that. I'm going to put <sighs> the uh, Wikipedia article that lists uh, those people that I was just talking about um, I'll pop it in the chat as well and it also has their inventory scale so it was this whole big psychological assessment that they put together um, the further you go down the rabbit hole with actually researching this topic the more amazing it is you know it it can come out in symptoms like really this i love the depersonalization one because that's kind of where i got to with my own personal burnout story where i literally felt like i was walking through a movie where there was sort of no real attachment i was just going through the motions nothing was interesting or exciting and um there are very similar symptoms of of burnout to ptsd as well because it is this kind of a stress disorder and it's the cumulative long-term effect of stress and the stress hormones on our body um, that, that can kind of get us to this place. So that all sounds sort of depressing, I must admit. It's not the most fun topic, but I, I do love that we continue to be able to have this conversation, especially in our industry where it's so prevalent. And every time I talk about it, I get people coming up to me and saying, oh my gosh, that's that's me. Like, I've been feeling like that. What do I do? So where do we go from here, Jess? What should people be doing to sort of look out for these signs and symptoms in themselves? I think part of the issue is when it comes to burnout, when you're starting to look for the symptoms, it's probably a little too late. So I would say that doing check-ins regularly with yourself to, to work out, are you happy? Do you like what you're doing? Do you like where you're working? Are you happy in life in general is really important. It's something we really don't do all that often. And making sure that you are keeping tabs on what you consider to be important to you because that shifts over time. So I know for me, I definitely experienced extensive burnout in my last job um, and it wasn't until I went on maternity leave that I realized that I had hit burnout and that I needed a change and that I needed to do something different and when they talk about a change is as good as a holiday it really really is finding something new to do something new to invigorate you and the number of people that I've spoken to who have been incredibly I wouldn't say depressed but I would say morose is a nice way of putting it they're just they're yeah. at that point where they it's not exciting it's just boring it's day-to-day -day, like what you were talking about that depersonalization of not wanting to keep going through the motions at that point a change can really make a difference be that a change in changing jobs changing roles internally um, looking at doing something different in your own personal life to try and because I mean a lot of the a lot of the time we talk about oh if you're bored with your job just get a new job that is a huge luxury for a lot of people you can't yeah. always go and do that so finding something new to do that can help reinvigorate you and re-inspire you and doing something that is interesting to you to help get that spark back i think is really important 
Yeah, absolutely. Great. I love it. And look, you know, on a personal level, there are a few little changes that I like to implement in my own work. And that is about switching modes of what I'm working on. I actually had my one on one with my manager this week where I turned around and I said, look, I know that I have this repetitive pattern where if I do something for too long, I, I lose interest in it. And I've been spending a significant amount of time lately in introductory level uh, content, which I do enjoy doing. Um, but I find that if it's the only thing that I'm doing, my brain starts to go, oh, like I've got, I'm kind of falling out of love with this. And so, you know, my fix for that is to go and tackle a harder technical problem go and figure out how to do something hard go and learn something new go and deep dive into an area of azure that i know isn't isn't my strong point um and if i do that for too long if i work on stuff that's really really too hard my brain just gives up and goes oh my gosh i want to go back to some intro level stuff again so sometimes <laughs> just kind of context switching what you're working on a little bit or building in those breaks that if i'm doing a day of writing content that's intro level um you know taking some time out to do some harder technical stuff just kind of gives my brain a bit of a break um, and keeps things interesting. And finding, I find that finding what you love is really important. So finding things that you really love to do and making that part of your everyday. So I am, and I realise how exceptionally lucky I am to be in a job that I absolutely love doing. I love what I do. I love getting up of a morning. I love dealing with the people that I'm dealing with. I love my work as a whole. And trying to pinpoint what aspects of it that I love has allowed me to work out why this role works for me. And if I was to look for a new role, what I need in that new role in order to succeed. And I think yeah. that's probably the most import, important part when you're trying to combat burnout is to find out which parts do you love? What is it that you absolutely love doing? How do you like to receive your feedback? What is it that you want to get out of your job? So for me, as an example, um, I always go back to, and it sounds awful, I go back to the love languages. Oh, yeah. I love love languages. I, it, it, it helps me in dealing with so many people. And when it comes to love languages for my job, what I like to hear and what I like to get back is praise. I like to hear that I've done a good job. I like to hear that what I have done has made a difference to someone else. I don't want physical, tangible stuff. I just want to know that someone has appreciated what I have done. And so the job that I'm in now where I get feedback from my customers who tell me directly or send me emails to say, that was amazing. Thank you so much. I finally understand this. That's all I need. And working that part out has meant that I now understand what parts of my job I love, what parts I don't love so much. Um, but if I was to look at a new role, where I would need to look at moving. And I think when looking at burnout, you need to work out what it is you need to feel whole as a human, what makes you feel appreciated and loved and try and find a way to incorporate that into your job. Absolutely. I've put a link to the five love languages in the chat. So the website comes across as being sort of very heavily relationship based, but I, I do love the um, correlation between it's almost like identifying what makes you what makes you feel worthy and what validates you know the work you're doing and and who you are that, that definitely comes into it that's a, a great little tie-in there's a lot of talk in the chat too about hobbies so it's great to see you know lego has come up um and there's a lot of people in the industry that are big lego fans we won't ask jess about lego because we will not get off the call for the rest of the day <laughs> I am in the process of building right now. Oh, yeah. Hogwarts one with the owl, yeah? Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So I'm doing it in little bits. I want to make it stretch, mainly because tomorrow the um, guitars come out, and that's what I'm getting next. Oh, fantastic. That's really Sorry. cool. Um, I bought myself a new Canon digital SLR camera um, at the start of the pandemic, actually, I think, when I started to do more video stuff and I wanted a better quality web camera under the premise that I was going to get back into photography because I had a digital SLR camera a long, long time ago when they sort of first came out. Um, unfortunately, it has been more attached to the uh, 
tripod for work than anything else. Um, but while I was on holiday, I went and bought myself a Joby Gorilla Pod tripod that will hold the weight of this particular camera. <laughs> so I'm like, damn it, I'm going to take it off and go and do some long exposure stuff and, and start playing around with more of the manual settings. So it's hard to it's hard to find space for that kind of hobby, even when you know you enjoy it. But in amongst work and kids and housework and groceries and the repetitiveness of repetitiveness of every week, like to actually carve out the time to go and do stuff like that, um, it, it's tough, I, I will tell you, but super important for giving our, our brains a break. And I think that's the big thing. It's, uh, I think for a lot of us looking at our lives at the moment, it is scheduled back to back. I don't know about you, but I literally have 15 minutes to eat lunch today between 12.45 and 1 um, for my next meeting. So it's making sure that you are carving out time to enjoy the things that you love doing and actually like putting that in a calendar if necessary and saying, this is the time where I am going to do the thing that I enjoy doing. Doesn't have to be specified in there but saying this is my time no one else can touch it and I know a number of people who have that early in the morning before they get up I know if they're anything like me and have small children your early mornings are screwed so you usually end up doing it sort of later in the afternoon or evening before the small humans either um, get home or after they've gone to bed um, at least that's what I end up doing so it's trying to make sure that you are taking time for yourself and tied to that I think not just the burnout side, but also the mental health side, making sure that you're aware of your own limitations and that if you need to ask for help, you ask for help, that it's not a sign of weakness to ask for help. We have so many different systems available, particularly here in Australia, for us to be able to reach out and speak to people. Um, we've got uh, mental health treatment plans that are available if you speak to your GP that can then give you some subsidised um, mental health facilities to, to help you if you need them. And I am big on utilising that. I will put my hand in the air and say, I have a mental health treatment plan. I see a psychologist. I am on medication because I need to be and it has made me a better person and there is no shame in that whatsoever. You you do what you need to do in order to get better and if we get sick, we take medication for it and it's no different to your brain being sick. So if you can't produce your own serotonin, store-bought is totally fine. <laughs> Yeah, look, it, it's that it's the easiest thing to say and the hardest thing to do, right? Um, when I was going through my worst times with burnout, the last thing I wanted to do was talk to anybody. And if anybody asked me if I was okay, I'd tell them I was fine because I really did not want to have a conversation, conversation about it. And it, you know, it, it took something pretty serious um, for me to actually turn around and go, and someone to say, yeah, you're taking a break because <laughs> you're really not functioning anymore. Um, I, I didn't want to talk about it. Um, I'm a lot better at talking about it now. I think going back to the tribe and the relationship with your manager, I've got the kind of manager now where we can have that conversation every week about how I'm feeling. Um, and, you know, that that, that is just priceless, absolutely priceless in, a, in your work environment. Um, but, yeah, it's, it, it's not easy. It's the most courageous thing in the world when you're in that mode to actually it, – to actually verbalise it to somebody else. Um, I'm a big fan of a, a guy called Mitch Wallace who uh, used to work for Microsoft, who has started up an amazing resource called Heart on My Sleeve. Um, I'll find a link and drop that in the chat as well, which is all about encouraging people to speak up and taking a pledge that they will reach out and ask for help uh, when they're not feeling their best. And I think when you get to the point where you want to reach out or, or you feel like you need to reach out or you don't want to reach out, I think it can be really beneficial to reach out to somebody and say, hey, is this normal? And getting the validation back from someone to say, that isn't normal. You need to speak to somebody or no, you shouldn't be feeling that way or no, I don't. I, I don't think that's normal. So having those kind of conversations um, with people that you love and that you trust is really important and it can make a difference. We we don't want to see the people that we love and that we're friends with 
in pain or suffering. We want them to be their best selves. And sometimes that means having some of those tough conversations. So being open to having those tough conversations, if you've got the spoons for it, to be able to to guide them and, and, and push them in the right direction to get that help. Absolutely. And look, you mentioned about the spoons. I am better now at saying no to things than I used to be. And that's both in my personal life and in my work life. And I can Can you teach me? (laughs) (laughs) Look, I'm still a work in progress. I don't think I'm ever going to nail it completely, but I'm getting better at it. Um, My manager and I celebrate. I send him a message and I go, I said no to something. And like, we, we, we celebrate every time I tell my manager that I said no to something. And it's all because... I do have a degree of flexibility, but I do get an enormous number of requests to participate in things. And I only have a limited amount of time. Like I'm a human being and my time is a finite resource. And I hate to feel like I'm the person that's sort of picking and choosing what I do. But honestly, there are only so many hours in my day and I have to make sure that the work that I'm doing is effective and impactful. Um, and it, it's it's really channeled in the right direction. So that does mean that I can't say no. I yes. can't say yes, so to, yes everything. to everything. Um, the challenge is that I was really good at saying yes based on my capability. So if somebody asked if I could do something, I'd take a look at it and I'd think, am I capable of doing that thing? Do I know the topic? Do I know the audience? Is this something that I am capable of doing? What I've learned is <laughs> I need to frame those kinds of things based on my capacity capacity do I have the capacity to take this on in the time frame that they need it based on what else I've said yes to looking at my calendar and not all the work I do is in nice little appointments in my calendar either so I do need to balance the, the rocks in the jar I need to go through that analogy of making sure that if I've got some pretty big important rocks um, in the jar that I'm working on and that might be major conferences like ignite or it might be deliverables for customers or live presentations that I have to do, I can fit in some other smaller stuff. I can fit in a couple of blog posts or, you know, some feedback to a product group or some other bits and pieces of work and that's okay. But there is a limit, like my jar is a finite size. And so I can't go singing yes to everything without something else suffering. So I'm getting better at evaluating those requests and saying, I don't have the capacity right now. And then either putting it off to somebody else, telling them I'm sorry, but they're going to have to find someone else, or seeing whether or not it is something that really is that time bound and and could we reschedule it for the next month or the month after, depending. So it's not easy. I am a people pleaser. I hate to be the one who says no when somebody asks me. I am 100% the same. And it is really (laughs) hard to learn to say no. But I think having that having an up-to-date calendar, spending time on working out exactly what your capacity is and how many hours you have in the day and working out what you can and can't commit to is so important so that you don't overcommit. Because once you start overcommitting and you start saying yes to everything, people will come to rely on you to say yes. And that's when burnout happens because you end up being the yes person. You end up being the one everyone goes to because you never say no. So we've had conversations about this before, right? Where we both turn around and go, I think I said yes to a few too many things and now I'm drowning. Yeah, and it's usually right before our Women IT Pros call and we're like, how did this come around so fast? <laughs> so, don't, ask me, don't ask me how we're at the end of September already, I tell you. I have no uh, idea. I have no idea. Yeah, yeah, Lisa, we haven't even started talking about multiple time zones yet. Um, my colleagues are spread. I have one colleague in Australia. I have colleagues in the UK. I have colleagues in the US. I have colleagues in Europe, um, all on my immediate team. Um, and so time zones, oh, my gosh, I hate time zones. Time zones are fun. Um, but, you know, we uh, we split meetings. So part of my team um, that are in Europe and the UK will have a meeting with the US that I will then watch the recording of when I wake up in the morning. Um, and that's on a regular basis once a week. We do do some time zone meetings where we all get together at once. If we're working on something big enough where we want everybody in the room at the same time, usually that means it's a late night for me and a very early morning for the US um, and the Europeans kind of get it in the middle because just that's how the globe is shaped, (laughs) unfortunately. But we try to not do that very often. However, being part of a global team, 
sometimes we go, look, we actually do just want to sacrifice the fact that it's going to be an 11 p.m. or a midnight call because we do think it's important enough that we're all in the same space together talking about this live rather than having this split between the live and the people who weren't in the room because they were asleep at the time. So um, we, we, are, we do have to be mindful of, of that as well when it's needed. And, and making sure that you are preserving your own time as well and not just trying to fit things in because you're awake. So I'm very conscious of the fact that a lot of the meetings that I get invited to come to are between sort of 5 and 7 a.m. I am 100% awake at that point in time. I am not going to be jumping into a meeting at that time and I am very clear on when my working hours are and that I won't be joining those calls and making and drawing those lines for yourself. Again, very much a luxury that we have the ability to do, but if you can draw them for yourself, do. So that way you can preserve some level of sanity else you will end up, if you're working in uh, a multinational org, you will end up in meetings all over the place. Yeah, and there's a, a conversation in a chat at the moment about, you know, when you're in a position where you're in a workplace that doesn't respect that, um, and it's it's basically their way or the highway. And I know that 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 we say to people about going and looking for a new job and how again so much easier to say rather than do right not always having the luxury of being able to move that is the hardest thing ultimately you know i i know that you were in a tough role for a long time and you and now on the other side of that where you can see the benefit of of moving to a different organization but that's not the kind of thing that happens overnight um, I've, I'm having some interesting conversations with people at the moment in various parts of the industry who aren't particularly happy where they are and they don't feel like they can go out and announce on social media that they're looking for a job because that's not a good look um, to your current employers. So I'm sort of just encouraging them to reach out to their networks of people that they have a relationship with um, through different vendors or industry groups or, or whatever and, and just start conversations with people you're already connected to to say that you would be interested in looking at other options because I think we just assume that people are happy in their jobs, that they're not looking for other opportunities. And so if we hear something that comes up on the grapevine, we wouldn't necessarily think to connect an opportunity with somebody that we know unless we know that that person that we know is in a position where they're looking. So sometimes there certainly is value and just reaching out to the people that you've got those existing relationships with in terms of conversations in the industry to say, hey, if you know of anything that's going, this is the kind of thing I'm looking for and I'd, I'd appreciate an intro. So it certainly doesn't hurt. I don't think that anybody would see that as an intrusion, certainly if, and I, I was saying this to somebody the other day, there's a big difference to me between someone that I've already had a conversation with saying, um, I I'm, I'm, would be open to a new role. This is the kind of thing I'm looking for. Could you keep me in mind? And I'll say absolutely, as opposed to a random person that I've never met before on the internet that messages me and says, can you get me a job at Microsoft? Like that is a completely different, a absolutely. Completely different and scenario. It's, it's hilarious you mentioned that actually, because I literally got pinged on LinkedIn by someone I have never worked with, I've never spoken to, who added me on LinkedIn and said, I'm applying for these roles inside of Microsoft. Can you give me a referral? And I'm like, no, that's that's not how this works. <laughs> I'm not going to refer someone unless I have either worked with you or known you for an extensive period of time and know how you operate. Because my integrity is on the line. So no. Um, but I think having that group of people that you can speak to to say, I am interested in looking for a new job, or ha even having that group of people who can help validate your skills. Because as Tanya said, sometimes you don't feel like your skills are worth it. Like when you're in that rut, you don't feel like you can go for another job. And you can have those people who are like, no, you're being silly. You are 100% worth more than what you're being paid now. You're not appreciated. You need to go somewhere else. Here's some roles. So. So I am conscious of the time, but I'm going to wrap up with something that we haven't spoken about on this call yet that is also on my radar at the moment for keeping my mental health in check, and that is exercise. Like that horrible word that starts with an E. And the only reason I say it is because I find a direct correlation between my lack of exercise and my mental health. So if I'm getting to a stage where I'm feeling 
overwhelmed or disconnected or feeling like things are a bit of a grind, I go back to my Fitbit and I see how many times I've logged exercise in the past week or two weeks and it will be completely sad. And so for me, I need to push myself to get out of bed in the morning and take the dog for a walk or to jump on the rowing machine or to do something. And it doesn't happen every day. I think my goal, my target at the moment is three days a week, right? If I can hit three days a week, I'm happy. More than that is great. Three days a week kind of needs to be my minimum. And I don't do it because I love it. And I don't do it because I want to improve my fitness or lose weight or anything else. I just, I need the clarity in my brain that comes from stepping away from the keyboard, raising my heart level, even if it's just walking um, and, and getting out of that space as well. So for all I'm of the people who I'm push themselves to, to go and do that for, for their mental health, damn it, it works. <laughs> I hate to tell it's, you that it And I think I, I say even taking that little bit of a step um, towards getting vitamin d like i am 100 percent. i love my led tan i like hiding inside darkness is wonderful but just getting out of the house sometimes and getting some vitamin d i recently bought a hammock so that i can sit outside of a lunchtime to be able to at least sit in the sun and it's made a massive difference to my mental health and the how my days go if i can get outside so i think even just taking that first little step of oh my god there's an outside i can i can go outside doing that that's a good first step um I figured out the secret to my mother's success in, uh, in life, and it is that she loves to hand water her garden. And the number of times that I have used the break time round about lunchtime to go out and connect the shower head to the hose and stand there and put some water on the garden without my phone in my hand at the same time, that's the caveat, um, yeah, you know, the, the sunshine, the fresh air, um, the watering the plants, there's just something about that combination that is magical, that is an exercise per se, but it certainly helps my mood. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And, and for me, the garden, cleaning the pool, I found getting out and doing the repetitive motion of cleaning a pool, it's really quite relaxing. <laughs> It's excellent. All right. I am going to wrap this up. We've had some great conversations in the chat. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'm going to let Jess go and get her lunch break before she's on her next call. Um, I am hashtag mum life. I'm running down to school to pick up my daughter who's been doing a school holiday activity this morning um, and knew that mum was going to be late because she was on a call. So I'm going to jump in the car and run down to school and pick up my 12 year old. Um, yeah, that, that'll be this. That'll be the start of my lunch break. But thank you, everybody, for joining us. This is such an important topic. And I love the fact that we can still have this conversation. I think we will continue to have this conversation. But I love that we are in a group of people that that like to share and ask questions um, and you know make this a, a conversation that we're comfortable having um, with certain people so hopefully this helped and there was some tips and advice in there anything you want to finish with Jess? Nothing at all just if you are feeling like you are experiencing burnout or any mental health issues please do reach out to someone be it someone close to you someone in your close tribe a loved one or reach out to any of those support lines that we put in the chat at the very beginning um, you are definitely not alone and there are people there who can help. Absolutely. And then the more we talk about this, especially in the IT industry, oh my gosh, the more you realise how not alone you are and how um, a lot of people have gone through something similar. So that's a great way to end. Thank you, everybody. Um, Two quick notices, uh, Microsoft Ignite is coming up at the beginning of November. So we'll plug that again in the October call, but that is the 2nd to the 4th of November US time. I'll drop a link in the chat. And then next month's call for October, Simone is going to do a session for us on Azure Lighthouse, um, which is one of my favorite topics. We'll go back and do a technical one again about how you can use that to manage multiple different Azure environments. So that'll be Thursday, the 28th of October as our next call, and I'll get the details for that up on Eventbrite probably next week. Oh, VMworld. Lisa's just mentioned VMworld is next week. Excellent. Ooh, exciting. Yeah. Yeah, VMworld's pretty cool as well. So a little bit going on between uh, now and the next couple of months. So take care, enjoy it, and we'll catch you next month. See you next month.